Hello. Welcome to another episode of The Horrific Podcast. We're two friends who live in different places but share a love for scary movies. Each week we both watch the same movie on our own and then record a conversation together about what we liked, what we hated, if we were scared, and maybe even some larger truths about why people watch horror movies in the first place. This season we're going to be focusing on horror subgenres and how they've changed over time. Hope you enjoy it and thanks for listening. So here we are, reanimated for the end of our mini series on the slasher subgenre. So far, so good. I don't want to say this has been my favorite section yet because we got a lot of dope sections coming up. But I've loved, I loved what we've done so far. Yeah, I feel going like to the zombies as well. This is just, yeah. You just need to come up with every idea for every season, man. I always yeah. enjoy your seasons more more than when <laughs> I when I do it. Well, it it goes both ways, right? Like I feel like anytime it's not my idea, I can just sit back and enjoy it. Whereas when it is my idea, it's something I feel like like more invested in trying to make it really, really good, um, or like more self conscious about is it good enough? Maybe would be the right way of describing it. So, anyway, yeah, uh, slashers I think are probably the biggest overlap with what you like or want out of a horror movie. So this has been a good one for movies that you love. I've gotten into some that I liked. I've not loved all of them, but that's okay. That is a thing that we can talk about. And I was really excited for this week because it, it, we're kind of coming back to a movie that I think we've both watched, but I don't think we've done an episode on. So it was a good chance to like revisit that, but kind of talking about how we got here, you know, we we've gone back through these lists of slashers over time. And we started with psycho and how really that was kind of like the seed from which a lot of types of movies about bad humans came out of. And then we had the bird with the crystal plumage. If I remember that correctly, <laughs> which was Dario Argento's directorial debut, um, which was sort of the giallo style and, Really, I feel like that kind of set the tone. Like, you can see the through lines all the way to Scream with that, like with how you have the mysterious killer and, you know, he gets unmasked at the end and there are the misdirects and things about who it might be and everything. So Vertical killings, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, So, yeah, and you could kind of see, like, how this idea of, like, the modern slasher is evolving over time. And then we get into sort of the golden age of slashers with Friday the 13th which was, you know, obviously not the one that kicked it off, but it was an important movie because it really did establish a lot of those rules that just were sort of uh, essential to the genre from that point forward. And then everything kind of dropped off and slashers were just like non-successful sequels and kind of not relevant. You know, action movies were a bigger deal at the box office. People weren't really going to see slashers. It was a more niche kind of grindhouse uh, counterculture type thing until 1996 when Scream came along and made it relevant to a whole new generation. So that's what we talked about last time. And I find it really interesting to th- read about what happened with slashers after scream because scream was almost like making fun of the tropes of slasher movies and pointing out the things that they did that were like unoriginal and predictable, but they revitalized the genre so much that then a bunch of movies came out that were unoriginal and unpredictable and made just a boatload of money at the box office <laughs> for like the next 10 years. Right. Yeah. It, One thing I was thinking about with Scream after after when I was editing the episode, I was kind of thinking about this. I don't know what it was like before Scream as far as like the rules for Slasher goes. Was that like a known thing or did Scream kind of like bring – like was that oh, almost like an yeah. unspoken thing and then did yes. Scream – And that's strictly just based off, I feel like, just our age. I mean, we were young when Scream came out. So, you know, I was just kind of curious, like, if we have longtime slasher fans listening, I'd be curious to know what it was like before, if, like, the rules were kind of a thing before or if Scream kind of brought it. Because what they did was said, hey, these are the rules. We're going to make you think that we're following some of them, but we're not going to follow it them all exact and just kind of mess with you a little bit. 
So I kind of think that based off of that, that that may have been something that was talked about before, but just a guess. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think that the rules really were just sort of the outline of the formula that slasher movies had been following for a long time at that point. I think that they were sort of the stereotypical, you know, low budget. I need to throw this rough story around a bunch of stylized, gory killings, and I'll put that out and make some money off of it. And, and, you know, because at the time, I think the word that is is most relevant to the slasher subgenre in the early 90s, kind of leading up to Scream, is stale. I think, like, everything I've read just talks about how it was stale, it was a formula, it was paint by numbers, and the rules were really just kind of pointing out some of those common reoccurring themes in those movies that had just been made without really any attempt at innovation. That's a, that's a very good point. I didn't, didn't think about the staleness of it. Um, yeah. But yeah, so, so scream, like obviously that resonated, right? Like people, I feel like it was in a really creative move to kind of point out the the reasons why the genre wasn't interesting anymore and then also find a way to to reinvigorate it and to kind of like by pointing that out you can add new elements and, and make them seem less tired and you know sort of play with how that interacts with like your expectations and the way the story actually unfolds mm-hmm. and then adding that kind of mystery about who is the killer and everything added that additional hook, plot hook you know that kind of pulled you through uh, and otherwise kind of, you know, standard narrative that you have in some of these slashers. But Scream really changed the game. And I, I didn't really appreciate, like, to what degree until I took a look at a site called Box Office Mojo. And I looked up the highest grossing slasher movies of all time. And so I started with number 10, which is the movie that we're actually going to talk about today which is Rob Zombie's Halloween that came out in 2007. Really? That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. And then um, working the way my way up from there, right next to it are A Nightmare on Elm Street, the 2010 version, and Friday the 13th, the 2009 version. So basically, you within a span of three years, you had like the three kind of classic 70s, 80s franchises Mm -hmm. get like a reboot. And that did really, really well financially. But once you get past that, the years on the movie are 1997, 2003, 2003, 2000, 1997, 1996. Whereas if you go the other direction from number 10, there are a couple of like late 2000s movies, but not very many. Um, (laughs) As you scroll through the list, like, this time of 1996 when Scream came out until around 2010 when the Nightmare on Elm Street remake came out, they were just printing money. And and these were not like new ideas other than I Know What You Did Last Summer because that was kind of like a fresh one. A lot of these really were just kind of reboots or sequels of existing franchises. And so it's funny to me because Scream was very like meta, like very making fun of the rules in some of those classic franchises and stuff, but it also seems to have kicked off a new interest for a new generation in those movies that allowed for reboots of them that were just wildly successful financially. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if that's like, well, no, sorry. I was going to say, I wonder if that's adjusted uh, for inflation, but don't really necessarily care about that more. So I think it kind of, kind of proves the point of kind of like what we've talked about in this section though is um like what we touched base on the first episode was the like the lineage of it in a way and and how you know just in the 60s really is when this kind of started as an idea but took a little as far as slasher goes kind of started 60s and then took a little jump in the 70s had a little slide then big in the 80s another little slide and then 1996 and now anything past that that's a slasher seems to be a money maker um just kind of interested in how that lineage worked i guess it kind of makes sense though because also in the 70s is when you had actors that were it was almost like taboo 
to be, you yeah. know, in slasher and, you know, it wasn't something to brag or write home about. But now you got movies making money. Anyone is going to act in them. That's the way yeah. I feel. Yes, definitely. Um, and, and sorry, one thing I needed to bring up on that is that is uh, domestic box office on that list. So U.S., uh, rest of the world makes those numbers change. But yeah. Um, also, what's interesting is that uh, at number 10 was the 2007 Halloween reboot. At number one is the 2018 Halloween reboot. <laughs> So, oh my gosh. So it's kind of funny. Um, everything yeah, comes full actually, circle there, but yeah. So, Scream was the highest domestic grossing uh slasher for uh, gosh, 22 years, and then Halloween came along and uh unseated it finally. But it's Scream, just the impact of that, I feel like we can't overstate, and so yeah, how great um, it is, yeah. Yeah, and so we wanted to come back this week and talk about Rob Zombie's Halloween from 2007 because that was really kind of at the tail end of when these movies were really making a lot of money. After that, it wasn't – I feel like there hasn't been as much of the, like, pop culture obsession with it because I feel like a lot of people switched to, like, zombie movies around that time or, like, TV. And so um, the 2010s are kind of a weird time, but then obviously the Halloween – the next Halloween remake in 2018 sort of put some juice back in it again. I think it's kind of, I think really what's happening with slashers is it's just becoming too much of a reality and people are like, let's go back to zombies. I think that's what they were thinking (laughs) in the early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the other thing too, I think one of the reasons why I really want to do the Halloween that we're doing is because one, we haven't done it yet Two. I almost kind of forgot about it in a way. Um, <laughs> it, really, you and I were talking. Uh, it was around Halloween. I don't remember if it was this year or last year. Um, and you you talked about how you watched that. And I was just excited because I was like, gosh, I f- f- forgot all about it. I get kind of frustrated with myself. And so I was like, God, I, I got to watch it. I watched it and I was like, we need to do an episode on this one. So yeah, yeah. I'm just excited all around anyways. Couldn't like think a of a better dog. time. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, we'll uh, get into it. I'll do a quick introduction, and then do you have fun facts this time? I do. Cool. Then you can do your fun facts, and then we will get into the nature versus nurture psychotic details. In 2007, the Weinstein Company, Dimension Films, and Metro Golden Mayer brought us Rob Zombie's Halloween. This gritty remake of the classic slasher tells mostly the same story, but also spends more time on Michael Myers' childhood and early time in Smith's Grove Sanitarium with Dr. Loomis. But, just like in the original, when Michael breaks free, there's hell to pay in his hometown of Haddonfield. This movie was made on a budget of around $15 million and made over $80 million at the box office internationally. And domestically. Total, is what I'm trying to say. It can currently be streamed for free on Tubi. God bless Tubi, man. Yeah. So what did you learn about this movie? So there are a few. I think what I've learned most about this, it it seemed like there were just a lot of random issues with it. So I'm going to kind of lump it into one kind of fact for this. So, one of the things that they kind of kept running into with this movie is uh, they put a wig on the mask and it, you couldn't take the mask off without the wig coming off. And so like, basically that's why a lot of the clips just show just his face without hair. Something with taking it off. It, I don't know. They just didn't like it. I would think personally that a wig would just go on it and you could just take it on and off whenever, but that turned out to be a big deal. Just like to tell you. The other kind of lumped into that, there were a few like other, I don't want to say like wardrobe malfunctions or, but similar issues like that. Uh, the one specifically, one of the girls was getting pulled by the foot, her shoe kept falling off. So they literally had to tape his hand to her foot yet again, kind of just seems like a, a weird problem, but they keep coming <laughs> Another thing, which isn't necessarily funny, but 
at the end when Lori fell off, like she hurt herself pretty bad. Like there, it just almost seemed like the set was like kind of cursed in a way. So like the stunt performer who was doing performing for Lori hurt herself. Uh, the actor portraying Michael hurt himself. Uh, there were multiple like actual trips and people getting hurt. And then on top of that, so they're filming in Los Angeles for this one, much like the original. Uh, they ran into the same type of problems. One of the problems is how do you how do you show fall in California? I guess in Southern California where they're at. Uh, yeah, because it's supposed to be Illinois, and so they basically ran into problems with that. They had to like create multiple different seasons, so you had the scenes with snow and all that. Uh, you know, there was also houses that they recorded at. So there were a couple where they recorded at the actual house that took place uh, or that uh, the original film took place. And so like in kind of the background while like recording some of those scenes, like they were getting rocks thrown at them by neighbors <laughs> because like, they were like, you're not, <laughs> you're not like get away. Like we're, you know, kind of tired of it. Uh, a house that they were recording one of the scenes where uh, I think it, her name was Annie was getting killed. Um, they weren't allowed to like have any blood on the floor. Like the homeowners were like, no, you can't do that. But like everything else is okay. And so that's why like, she's like dead, but she, or she's like, has just blood on top of her, but none below her. And she's like on a rug too. That was like their way that they were trying to prevent that. Um, it was Annie who also, she was the one who was being dragged is when she was getting dragged back onto the carpet when her shoe kept falling off. Um, yeah, it just seemed, seemed like a problem like there's issues with the sheet that michael covers himself and puts the glasses on uh to portray as as bob um there were a couple scenes in this movie as well that tried to or you know that they wanted to kind of pay homage to originally they had bob uh being killed another way but rob zombie reshot the scene so it mirrored the same shots and music, Blue Horse Cult, Don't Fear the Reaper, as mm. Judas' murder earlier in the film, as well as Bob's death in the Carpenter's film. Um, just kind of paying homage a little bit to it. I think that I'm going to go ahead and just stop it there, other than saying the fact that Danielle Harris, who plays Annie, was also in the uh, Halloween 5 and 6 in the late 80s when she was 11 and 12. So that was the eighties and she's portraying a high school student in 2007 (laughs) and I love it. So those are my, those are my facts. I mean, those are pretty basic facts. I know I haven't done it in a while and I just wanted to do it again. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the music because the music was not, it it kept confusing me because you think Rob Zombie making a slasher film, you expect like heavy metal, maybe some like industrial kind of like dark, heavy stuff. And it was just like a lot of classic rock. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like not at all what I would have thought he would have picked for the soundtrack for this well, movie. I mean, I actually looked it up because I was like, mm-hmm. well, what is like, where, what is this? So there's a song by Kiss, God of Thunder, Don't Fear the Reaper was on there. Uh, Only Women Bleed, that's by Alice Cooper. Mm-hmm. Um, Halloween 2, that's Misfits. Tom Sawyer, Baby I Love Your Way. Um, yeah, Peter Frampton, uh, Mr. Sandman. That's obviously pretty, mm-hmm. pretty famous. Love hurts. Like there are so, <laughs> there are so yeah. many and I'm, I'm right there with you because it's like not expected just knowing Rob Zombie as a musician. I think yeah, from like sure. the devil's rejects, it kind of makes sense if that, yeah. you know, yeah, the soundtrack sure. kind of lines up. Yeah. 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 But in general, this one I thought was interesting because it definitely went more into, Michael is a human, not as Michael Myers, the invincible serial killer. So you got to see him kind of as a kid growing up. His home life had real sling blade vibes to it. And, you know, he was like bullied at school and then ends up, you know, committing murders. Kind of the the recreation of the famous one from the beginning of the previous movie or the original movie. And then he ends up in the... Uh, sanitarium or whatever the 
the mental institution was called. And you get to see some of his interactions with Loomis and kind of how his life went over time, all leading up to sort of when he finally got out. And I thought that that was really interesting background to give on the character. And that was an interesting choice to, to be able in like, I don't know, try to develop him before he became sort of the way he was for all of the previous movies. And I, I was curious what your thought was on that. Did, was that a cool creative choice or was that filler that you didn't need? Cause you just want the guy that stabs people and doesn't die. Boy, talk about someone who knows you. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I felt like I was going back and forth throughout this whole movie. That's the reason why I said, feels like someone who knows you part of my part. I felt like part of my, part of me was saying like, um, I really wish they now granted he was in the asylum or mental hospital or whatever in that period. But it's like, I, that's the section I'm kind of also interested in. Like what happened before then, like even in the asylum itself and then thinking of ideas, it's like, I feel like there could have been some pretty cool things that they could have done. And then like ended like when he sees Lori, you know, like, kind of like when he first sees him in the original, just something like that I thought would have been pretty cool. Um, but then I just liked the, the different take on it. I mean, it's yeah. it, it also confusing for the fact of like, oh, this is supposed to be like in 2007, not in the 70s. Mm, yeah. You know, yeah, like yeah. there was just a few things that would just kind of was throwing me off a little bit about it. Um, but no, I didn't, I didn't necessarily have a problem. I felt like it was a different take. I didn't think that they were like trying to say the original was done wrong or anything like that, which I, mm -hmm. I sometimes struggle with. Like for instance, like true Grit, they're like, Oh, that's not really how the book goes. And it's like, who gives a shit? I'm just here for yeah, the movie. Right, right. And, and so like for this, I was like, yeah, no, this is, this is cool. I like the different take on it. I like to see him like as a kid, even if it was not the longest section it was still something you could see the obsession with masks masks were kind of interesting how they did it but like kind of confusing but all mm -hmm. in all the only real beef i had with this is just the dialogue which is like a standard rob zombie <laughs> yeah right thing but uh other than that no i was cool with it i thought maybe it made it easier because i like the original and it's like i want to know more about yeah you know, the Michael and, and all them, maybe that's why, but I didn't seem to have any issues with it. Yeah. I feel like this one was definitely made by like a huge fan of the original movie. And so it was almost being made from the perspective of what would other big fans of the original movie like more of in this one. And I, so I thought most of like the kind of creative choices or the changes were coming from a place that catered to that, which, you know, sort of like people like us, are going to respond well to it. And I agree that I, I don't think it was like a criticism of the original. I think it was just like, oh, yeah, I love the original. I'm going to make a movie heavily inspired by it. And so I thought that was cool. I, I feel like in general this movie was bigger and more intense and more over the top than the original. So Michael was stronger and more deadly and more brutal and meaner <laughs> you know like like just in general right. he was a much larger kind of more imposing figure than in the original which i think was like effective for the type of movie it was trying to be yeah yeah i can see that i think that the other thing i was kind of thinking of was like you know think about like superhero movies like even in the 90s mystery man Dude, that's the best one ever. For the record, that's the best superhero film ever. Uh, but for, I was initially thinking of like Superman, like from the mm. 70s, you know, 70s yeah. movies. It, and think about like what we have nowadays and you can see like it, all his powers, even like on Smallville, the TV show. Um, like it, it just seems you know, leaps and bounds above. So like I was thinking like they're going to have to explain. Well, I was kind of thinking they're there were a few things that were going to have to kind of answer the mask thing. I felt like was something that they could touch on. Um, and then also like, where does this come from? Like, I think like in the original, you kind of got the feeling like it was just like, it was just straight up evil. As we yeah. kind of progressed in society, we realized that like, no, like 
that's a possibility not, not just evil but like you have something going on in in you know some sort of mental illness going on um it also can be by how shitty parents you know that just <laughs> right straight up so i was cool with it from that the thing i was thinking about going into this though watching it was like is this the like pulling the mask off and or like seeing the the villain and like being let down so like yeah. the build-up is is more like in my head was his upbringing better or worse than what he what rob zombie did in the film i think it was better what he did so yeah. i had no beef based off of that point of view yeah um I was also real happy to see Sid Haig. Yeah. You know, he walks funny. He does. Yeah. He's yeah. perfect for the roles that Rob he Zombie was. uses him yeah. in. Yeah. And there's Ken Forhey too. He was, uh, one of the facts about him actually was that he's like the worst dead actor ever. Apparently like Rob <laughs> Zombie like had to do CGI because he kept breathing and like blinking oh, while he yeah. was supposed to be dead on the floor. So, <laughs> but yeah, it was cool to see like, I mean, a lot of the people from devil's rejects are in here. Um, I don't know their names off the top of my head, but like the musicians, uh, one of those guys is the guards. Uh, a couple of the the main characters are also guards at the asylum as well. They're walking them out that initially get killed. Um, it's just I like that Rob Zombie has his crew and he's and he's true to him. If that yeah. makes sense, yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I. There were a lot of things I liked about this. It definitely made a lot of references to scenes from the original without spending a bunch of time on trying to recreate them exactly. So there were reasons to keep watching because there were, you know, variations on things. But overall, I feel like a recurring theme with slashers I've seen that have been made from like this point forward is that from about the two thirds mark, they start to lose me a little bit. And there were some things on this one that I, I think contributed to that. Like one was like, it's a Rob Zombie movie. So everybody is like less likable and less relatable. Like I did, I felt no connection to the Lori character. I had no like desire for her to survive. Really. She was kind of annoying. In and fact, I was going to say the, yeah, I had the exact opposite where I was oh, like, really? I, I can't. Yeah. I just saw her as so annoying that I was like, it's time for you to go, Lori. That was my beef with the film. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I, yeah, I did not right. care. I, I was not uh, cheering for her to survive at all. Yeah. I'm just like, <laughs> all right, let's wrap this up. Um, but the it also had kind of some of the – definitely was falling into like some of those tropes or like the rules that Scream talked about. And maybe it's just because we watched that recently that now I'm on the lookout. But it's like, oh, yeah, the teenagers who sneak off to make out are obviously going to die, even though there's no real reason that Michael would be in that house if he was after Lori and stuff like that. But and I also thought they foreshadowed Lori being his sister way too early. Like that could have been a big reveal later on, but it was just like, I don't know that it, it didn't, it felt like the story lost the ability to be compelling at a certain point. Yeah. And then it was just kind of rinse and repeat of, okay, now he's pursuing her, trying to kill her. There's going to be a few more elaborate deaths on the way, but we all know where this is headed. And then in right. the end, she uses Loomis's gun to shoot him in the face. And so you didn't even have like the classic ending of yeah. knowing, you know, that he gets up and disappears and, and is invincible and stuff. Like he, he was definitely like bigger and more physically powerful in this one. But I feel like they also didn't really do any of the stuff that made him seem like an, an unstoppable paranormal force in the beginning, which kind of took the intensity out of it for me. Yeah. Yeah, which is like we're there for for like the first couple films, but then like don't have like Halloween eight out. That's that's my kind of opinion yeah. on on the unstoppable force. Yeah, I think I think for me, it, almost like in a way, like not judging, but just just for lack of better words, just like poor uh, execution. Uh, I couldn't agree more on like the um, keeping the sibling a secret part of it it would have made sense considering you have the baby at the beginning of this i mean like the baby cries after the mom kills herself like you know the baby's there so okay that like they could have saved that for sure 
And the other part with the poor execution, what I'm, what I also kind of mean is the dialogue piece of it. Because if you didn't have anything bad to say about this film, Daniel, I was going to bring up that we cannot talk about how bad Scream's dialogue is if we are <laughs> loving this film. Because there's, right. I went back and did Scream too because like I, I have notes from both because I was like I was going to point out the shitty like the terrible dialogue you know from both like a 50 year old for scream like writing things that they think high school kids are saying and right, like yeah. rob zombie almost kind of be out of touch because yeah. my favorite one from this though was um i don't like to sound conceited but i'm the hottest fucking cheerleader we have they have I'm the hottest mm-hmm. fucking cheerleader they have. And it's yeah. like that whole piece after that was just the worst conversation I'd ever heard in my entire life. It was like, yeah, it's like someone smoking a cigarette that doesn't know how to smoke a cigarette. It's the same thing for people cussing because they put the cuss words in the wrong place. Yes, I'm the exactly. fucking yeah, hottest absolutely. cheerleader is how it should have been. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. not, I'm the hottest fucking cheerleader. I, that's just preference on cussing, yeah. but that's just my opinion. Yeah, it just doesn't sound natural. It, like, it, like it sounds very thing. much. Yeah, it sounds very much like a a grown ass man trying to write the way that sassy teenagers yes. would talk. Yes. <laughs> and it just yes. does not yes. translate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's Rob Zombie. Like if you go back, like it's like he has a different way of like kind of speaking, like his own kind of like dialogue. Like he puts the cuss words yeah. in right. weird spots, or maybe like he allows the actors to ad lib them or something. But yeah, it's just it's strange. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, overall, I would. This wasn't a perfect movie. I I would call it a pure slasher. Like there was no real mystery to solve. I guess Michael was a serial killer technically, but the focus of the movie was his rampage immediately after getting out of prison. Like you weren't really ever worried about the cops, like trying to catch him and stop him or anything. Like there was no misdirect about his real identity. It was just this guy got out of prison and he's on a murderous rampage and that's going to continue until something or someone stops him. And so the focus of the movie was sort of the terror of that and the people he was attacking. But by the end, it honestly, it just felt kind of long and I can really say I enjoyed, you know, about the first two thirds of this movie. And I liked that it was grittier and more intense, but it just, it kind of started to feel slow And it like it was having trouble managing the pace because it had already done everything that it was going to do. Like how many times can he pop up in a new scene and just stab somebody before you're like, okay, cool. Like that's what we're doing. The movie isn't giving me anything else in between to really keep me engaged. And maybe that wouldn't be the case for teens who had at the time only seen like, I know what you did last summer. And so this felt, you know, more fresh or exciting or scary, but I don't know. As somebody who's watched a lot of slasher movies over the years, I kind of felt disengaged by the end of it. Did you have the same feeling or no? Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, there was... I don't know if it was like I felt like there was... Like I was happy with like the first, like you were saying, kind of like the first two thirds, where like once it got to the last half, I was just kind of like done with it in a way. Mm -hmm. Like just like, okay... Like, here we are. <laughs> like, let's yeah. do this. Um, but yeah, I just was completely, completely disengaged at that point. 100%. Yeah. yeah. But like, here's the thing. Don't let these comments stop you guys from watching. I I highly recommend it. Like, this is like, I feel like Rob Zombie should have its own like category of horror films or, or films in general. Where like, yeah. And, you, and that may be a part of it too. You allow to be bad. You allow, yeah. you know. Um, because like, it's a fan. I, I like, like we've said before, I just feel like it's a fan making them and I loved it. So, yeah. And and I think it probably hurts this movie too, that we both like other Rob Zombie movies more. And so by comparison, it's just like, well, you know, when the devil's um, rejects is like in one of your top 10 favorite of all time, it's going to be difficult. I feel like anything else they do kind of (laughs) like get out. But yeah. Yeah. But but yeah, so then obviously, as we talked about before, I just realized this list that I was looking at for box office stops in 2019. So there have definitely been movies since then uh, that 
are going to be at the top of the list. But for the point we were trying to make, like this period after Scream for about the next 14 years or so was really, really prop- profitable for slashers. And they were a big part of pop culture. And before they kind of fell off again, that definitely picked back up in 2018 when the Halloween <laughs> remake requel, I guess, came out Ugh, yeah, and made like a boatload of money. But that really kicked off a bunch of others. Like it kicked off new Scream movies for the first time in like 10 years. And it kicked off a Texas Chainsaw remake on Netflix. And it kicked off a Candyman remake and a bunch of other stuff that have been made. And now those movies even have had sequels in 2023. And they've made money. But I kind of wonder if... Is... Do you think the genre is past its prime? Nah. Nah, there'll be a resurgence come through. But I mean, like the the movies that are kind of in this wave, were there oh, any oh, that yeah. you really thought were like, oh, wow, that really like pushed things forward? Or do you feel like it's just more like nostalgia grabs and re- recycling that same formula? Well, based off of uh, our 2019 statistics which also this was recorded in 2019 that's what i would have said for the record they don't know when we're recording this <laughs> right but, yeah uh it, life is good we don't know what pandemic is mm-hmm. you know it's so great in 2019 um uh, i think that what we're kind of going to get into is a mold of multiple um categories of of horror films and so like i think the next uh, evolution of slashers is going to be a combo with some other some other type personally that's what i kind of feel like there is a cash yeah, grab but and- there's always been a cash grab with any any type of success ever you know there's you could i feel like tool you really know this with tools but like if you if someone comes out with like a new tool that you can use the next thing you know there's a thousand different companies out there with the oh, same yeah. Yeah. concept and i just feel like that's gonna happen that's a cash grab it's what we all want to make money like we're you know want to yeah no i i agree with you and I, yeah. the thing i guess that i didn't specify was i'm saying like the pure slasher so like the movie uh, where it is you know like like basically like the one that we just talked about or even you know i really enjoyed terrifier but it also didn't feel like super innovative it just felt like a movie that did a thing that i already liked pretty well that's a good point yeah and last night we went and saw the newest scream which is scream six in a movie theater Mm -hmm. and i would say for about the first half of it i was really engaged and into it and like oh this is cool you know i'm seeing Ghostface on the big screen and like this is a good experience but man it felt like it dropped off and it was just like by the end the story had bent so far over itself to try and make its plot twists work that I just felt like this is, this is lost all the charm of the original. It really is just grasping to try and feel relevant. I think in 2023, and I don't really think it landed it. I I think that it had almost become a victim of the same things it was making fun of instead of like transcending that somehow. Like it, yeah. it didn't have all of that stuff in it that means like this is an inside joke for horror fans. It felt like it was trying to be more of like a Hollywood movie that made money at the box office without making people think too hard and did not really deliver on a lot of the things that it could have done well. Yeah. I feel like if there is a horror film that can that could get away with having as many sequels. It would technically, I'm saying technically because I don't firmly believe this is would be scream because it's, you know, different killer each time and they actually get a pop pop the killer at the end. But I have like a limit unless it's death wish on how many sequel or Rocky, how many sequels I want to see. Yeah. And at a certain point, any film that goes over, I don't know, like three, or four, it's just like, okay, we get it. Like, think of like Rambo. It's like, yeah, like he, he it's like he's an unstoppable force as well. It's just like it just goes so much. It's cash grab for sure. I do want to ask this question though. Okay. At the thirty minute mark, when you were watching the film on your B day, is that when your popcorn ran out? 
did you stop liking the film because you stopped having the thing that keeps you going? In retrospect, I think you're probably <laughs> completely accurate. Yeah, that that was about the time where I was like, I need to stop eating popcorn because I've already had an embarrassing amount, and if I keep eating it, and you I'm got mad at yourself, sick. and you took it out on the film, Daniel. <laughs> been a good section though looking forward to doing the next one now that we're officially finished with uh, slashers indeed and that's it for today's episode if you've listened this far then thank you and we hope you've enjoyed it we're always looking for new ideas so if you have any questions comments or movie suggestions please send us an email at the horrific pod at gmail.com or feel free to comment on or message our facebook page Just search for The Horrific Podcast. Thanks for listening. All right, talking Halloween. Just make sure we're on the same movie. (laughs) I think so. (laughs) I hope so, because I just finished it today. Okay.